ask these folks to uh, go back and have a good day, and we're going to discuss our various reports. Mike? Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, just the greatest privilege of my life is to serve as, as Vice President to the President, is keeping his word to the American people, and assembling a team that's bringing real change, real prosperity, and real strength and back to our nation. Thank you, Mayor. On behalf of the entire senior staff around you, Mr. President, we thank you for the opportunity and the blessing that you've given us to serve your agenda and the American people, and we're con continuing to work very hard every day to accomplish those goals. Well, that was the first full gathering of the U of U.S. President Donald Trump's cabinet, a televised meeting last June that looked to some unlike anything they'd witnessed in U.S. democracy before. You heard Vice President Mike Pence there and then White House Chief of Staff at the time, Reince Priebus, paying homage to the commander in chief. To President Trump's opponents, it seemed a lot like the way party apparatchiks would speak to a strong man in charge. David Frum is one of the best known and most determined of those opposing this president from within his own party. He's senior editor of The Atlantic magazine. He's the author of the new book, Trumpocracy, the Corruption of the American Republic. David Frum is with me in Toronto. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Andrea. What did that meeting say to you about this president and the men and women around him? I remember when people would talk like that to President George W. Bush and the door would close and they would leave and he would turn to the staff and he would just roll his eyes. Uh, that, that kind of flattery, I mean, I suppose it goes with the job, but to actually believe it, um, I don't think Barack, I, Barack Obama would have believed it. Um, I mean, they might have liked it, but they wouldn't have believed it. They certainly wouldn't have insisted on it. And that tells you um, that this person has broken these people. The assumption when Donald Trump came to power among a lot of Republicans was they would run him. He's running them. What is Trumpocracy? How do you define it? Uh, Trumpocracy is Donald Trump as a system of power. Um, that cabinet room you saw or at Camp David when he spoke those crazy things in the microphone and there are three uh, or four people over each shoulder nodding along, those people are part of the system. They enable him. And the question is, why has it worked? The whole system of the United States was supposedly designed to keep people like Donald Trump away from power, and if they somehow slipped into power, to control them while there. That system is failing, and Trumpocracy is the mode of government that has grown up in the failure of the American system. Now, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about that, because you do say enabling the bad people in the Trump orbit are the weak people. Mm -hmm. So who are we talking about here? Um, Members of Congress, let me give a, a tell story that actually sums this up. Um, H.R. McMaster is the National Security Advisor, three-star general, hero of Iraq and Afghanistan, author of an excellent book about the military in the Vietnam War, a real soldier intellectual, a man of integrity, one of the most admired soldiers of his generation. It was a huge relief to friends of America around the world when H.R. McMaster replaced Michael Flynn, who was compromised by the Russians and the Turks. McMaster made it his top goal to get President Trump finally to say an unequivocal defense of NATO. He booked a trip to NATO in April of 2017. He arranged a speaking event where Donald Trump would stand literally in front of the monument to Article 5, a twisted girder from the World Trade Center, uh, and would speak words to defend NATO. And just so there would be no mistake, McMaster wrote the words himself. So the president would say exactly the right thing. He, on the plane over, he, McMaster briefs reporters, and especially the New York Times, this is what the president will say, and this will close forever, the uncertainty about whether Trump is committed to NATO. Trump got the speech, came to that section, and whether because he has ideological commitments, whether the Russians have something on him, or whether he just balks at being told what to do, he refused to read the key words. The reporters naturally asked McMaster, what happened? You told us this would be in the speech. And McMaster, an honorable soldier, full of patriotism, what choice did he have? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. The president said exactly what we wanted him to say, exactly what he expected. we expected him to say. Nobody could listen to that speech and hear anything other than a defense of Article 5. So in other words, even the people who are least likely to enable him end up enabling him. Exactly. You say in your book, a rule of law state can withstand a certain amount of official corruption. What it cannot withstand is a culture of impunity. How does that apply to this administration? The United States is not is, is one of the more corrupt of the major democracies. That's always been true, partly because of the federal system. It has always been easier to bribe a police officer in the United States than, say, England or Germany. But it has a lot of systems to catch 
corruption. About an, something like 10,000 people have been sent to prison in the United States since 1990 for governmental corruption. Most of them are very, very you know, sheriffs, low-level people. What has been happening under Donald Trump is those systems are being turned off for the president of the United States. This president every day does something that would be the single biggest scandal of the whole administration if it had happened under another president. I'll give you another example. Donald Trump continues to operate his business. I mean, he says he's divested, but his sons run it. They report to him. There's no disclosure. No one knows anything. He receives millions of dollars of payments from partners in Turkey, the Philippines, uh, United Arab Emirates, I think, in, I think in Azerbaijan and other places, India, for the use of his name. How much? We don't know. Is it a flat fee or a percentage of something? We don't know. Those people have a grip on his livelihood. It's a grip so strong that the Filipinos sent as their ambassador to Washington, the, the developer of the Trump Tower Manila, the guy who signs the president's check from the Philippines is the Filipino ambassador to Washington. It would be an enormous scandal. The way we would disclose it, off. The uh, investigations, off. Uh, the actions off. He has turned off the burglar alarms. If you do something astonishing every day, eventually people will will forget the whole series. That means there will only ever be one astonishing thing that people are talking about. And what Donald Trump does, one of my mottos I, I coined at the beginning of the administration is the controversies will divert you from the scandals. So he will say something, he'll say something racially inflammatory. He'll uh, insult Haiti and Africa. So we all talk about that. It's hard to keep focused on the, the everyday, the financial stories, the contacts with Russia. And how, I, I'm not asking people not to do, I mean, when the president spills ink in your lap, you have to look at the ink in your lap. But that's why it works on the press. People ask, one of the questions people ask me is, um, is there anything new in Trumpocracy? And I answer, it will feel new because you've forgotten so much. Because there is so much. So in other words, we're drowning in all of these stories that individually we would we would be stunned by, right. but now we're just so surrounded by it, we don't know where to look anymore. Exactly. So there's, there's only ever one, maybe two at a time, because that's the way our brains are organized. Why does the Congress put up with it? So this is a, a deeper question. Jimmy Carter had an all-democratic Congress. Bill Clinton, in his first two years, had an all-democratic Congress. Uh, Carter and Clinton found Congress checking. There were lots of things that Presidents Carter and Clinton wanted to do that their Congress stopped them from doing. But since the middle 1990s, Congresses have become more partisan, and they only check presidents of the opposite party. They just look away from presidents of their own. And, and I, there are various ways in the book that I document that this, that this is so. So Donald Trump has basically an arrangement uh, with the Republicans in Congress. Paul Ryan is a true believer believes in very limited government, wants big tax cuts, wants to dismantle a lot of this government as it's existed since the 1930s. That's not a very popular agenda. No Democratic president would ever sign any part of it, and probably no Republican president aiming at re-election would even think about it either, because, you know, Mr. Ryan, you have a very gerrymandered Congress, you have this one tiny little district, I have to worry about winning millions and millions of votes, I will lose if I do what you say. Donald Trump has agreed to accept this radical Republican agenda that a George W. Bush or Mitt Romney would not have accepted. In return, Congress has extended him impunity. Uh, and the most striking example of this is the way they are actively compromising the investigation into the Russian attack on the American election. Uh, Devin Nunes, the head of the House Intelligence Committee, um, is the point man in protecting Donald Trump. Paul Ryan protects Devin Nunes. Um, and the House Intelligence, which should be investigating this, is completely neutralized. So let me ask you, during the Bill Clinton scandals of the 90s, Republicans often said that the character of the president matters. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of Democrats defended him back then. They're now having second thoughts about it. Did the character of a president in office ever really matter to the partisans? Um, I, I think America used to be a less partisan country than, than it was, and in certain aspects of the president mattered. One of the big changes that has happened, is, uh, and you can measure this, I have data on this, you can measure this. The group of people who are most likely to say, 10 years ago, most likely to say, does, does it matter whether the president is a personally good man? We're evangelical Christians. They were the most likely to say yes. They are now the least likely to say yes. They have adapted to Donald Trump too. That's part of the structure of enabling. The thing about Donald Trump is it's not just that, you know, multiply unfaithful to wives, conducted, you know, involved with prostitutes and strippers. He's just cruel in every way. He's cruel to his own children. And you would think evangelical Christians who care so much about the integrity of the family and per 
but it would bother them all the time, but they have in complicated ways and for their own reasons made their peace with it. David, from as you go through this book, you know, you are not and never were a Trump supporter. You point out in your book after the campaign, some of the never Trumpers have gone on to become his biggest boosters. What happened? Well, I was, I described myself as a, as at the beginning of the campaign as Trump curious. That is, I, I don't use the phrase never Trump about myself because at the beginning, I thought it was possible that he could do some good. In, in 2015, when Trump emerged, the party was on its way to running as the Paul Ryan party, that it was going to campaign on. My joke was uh, the Republican base was telling you they want more health care, less immigration, and no more Bushes, and they were being offered less health care, more immigration, and one more Bush. And that needed to be disrupted, and Donald Trump was disrupting it. And I thought, this is productive because he will show – he, he's promised not to touch Medicare. He promised to protect Social Security. He talked about the, the dislocations of uh, immigration. He was the first Republican to talk a lot about the opioid epidemic. Then I waited for some response, a Scott Walker, somebody like that to say, the way I'm going to beat Jeb Bush is by taking Donald Trump's issues and using them to put together a different kind of Republican platform. And then we'll have, you know, a normal kind of battle. Um, and we'll have a normal kind of nominee and maybe a normal kind of presidency. I didn't anticipate ever that he would actually win the nomination. That seemed like something, a joke out of The Simpsons. Um, but he did. Once he won the power, uh, once he won the nomination and then the presidency, the power of negative partisanship took over. That's why those never Trump people were reconciled. I don't know if that term negative partisanship means things to people. What does that mean? Okay. So... One of the mysteries in political science a decade ago was if you asked Americans, are you Republican, Democrat, or independent? Never in history had more people identified as independent than a decade. They were just leaving the parties. So what, what, what was very common to read in 2007, people say, well, gee, a third of the country is independent. Why are we so polarized? Because they always assumed that what independent meant was centrist in, in the middle. They were leaving the parties because the Republicans were too conservative, the Democrats were too liberal. They were looking for Michael Bloomberg there in the middle. So a political scientist named Alan Abramowitz got interested in this, and he began studying these independents. And what he found out two things. They weren't leaving from the middle. They were leaving from the edges. They were people who were too, that thought the Democratic Party was too conservative, not too liberal. People who thought the Republican Party was not conservative enough. And although they didn't like the Republican Party, although you got this big, I'm not sure, I'm in, you know, not Republican or Democrat, if you ask the question, which party do you hate? It turned out there were no independents, that every American hates one party much more strongly than he or she hates the other party. This is negative. I may be a weak Republican, but I'm a strong anti-Democrat or vice versa. So that's once you comp take over one of these parties, even if you do it with maybe only a third of the voters in that party really liking you, which is what happened to Donald Trump. Once you've got the party apparatus, you can then say, OK, maybe you don't like me, but Hillary Clinton is literally Satan. And when he said literally Satan, he meant literally Satan. Um, and since she's literally Satan, obviously it's better to have Donald Trump than Satan. That's right. So it's negative part. I'm not, I'm not that. So ergo, I'm this. Your hatred. Let your hatred, not your loyalty, not your principles, not your belief, let your hatred drive your vote. You know that there is backlash against uh, how you are, how you characterize this and how yes. you see this. And a lot of that comes from the fact that you were George W. Bush's speechwriter. You helped make the case for the war against Iraq. The conservative Washington Examiner, in its review of your book, writes, Trumpocracy is the empire naked, stripped from neoconservatism's noble rhetoric, exposing our own hypocrisy and welcoming solutions from men like from. How do you respond to that? Well, um, what we're seeing in the modern world um, is a convergence between certain elements of the far left, Bernie Sanders left, and certain alt-right people. Um, and they all hate the idea of a strong America at the center of a strong alliance system. And they see in Donald Trump somebody who will smash that. And they see in people like me, um, you know, people with more conventional politics, I'm, yeah, Bush Republican, um, supporter of the Iraq War, um, along with Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. And that's where the broad American center was. And they see that what these guys believe in is they believe in an American-led world order, and at least with Donald Trump, he's going to wreck it. A book is an object. Um, it exists independent of the author. Pick it up. Take a look. If you find it useful, it's useful. If it's not useful, um, you know, if... if uh, if I had done, if I, everything in my life I had done was something that you agreed with, and yet I wrote a non-useful book, why would you read it? Um, You've said you feel a sense of karmic ob obligation. Yeah. F as for your role in the Bush administration. What does that mean? Well, I, I mean, 
I served in an administration that didn't wasn't very successful. Um, it didn't achieve, and not just in foreign policy, but in domestic policy. My joke about the Bush administration is it, it, it opened with Pearl Harbor, it ended with the crash of 1929, and it had Vietnam in between. You know, it was a kind of bumpy administration. It didn't deliver results. It's probably the only administration I'll ever work in, um, and I was a part of it. So I feel like you know when you look back on your public service career, it's like that didn't go that well. So uh, yeah, I have a sense of, you know, I, I feel a lot of weight of responsibility to make things go better. Um, Oh, I want to talk about that because it's like it's like you're watching democracy shift in ways that 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 will allow it to dissipate at some point. And you're 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 waving your hand and saying, "Hang on, like pay attention to this." I, I quote in in the book a, a survey um, that asked the question: Is it very important important to you personally to live in a democracy? And across the developed world, not just in the United States, in Europe too, with if you group people by age 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, with each decade, the pr proportion who say, yes, it is important to me, goes down. Uh, the people who are over 70 are the most likely to say, it is very important to me personally to live in a democracy, people under 30, radically less. And uh, people under 30, if you ask them the question, would you rather have be led by a strong man who will govern without regard to parliaments and laws? About a third of young people across, across the developed world say, yes, they would like that idea. Um, Why do you think that is? That's a profound question. I, um, in part, it's because of the fading of the memories of World War II. That if you're 30, you can you, you think a strong a strong man will be a powerful leader who will, of course, agree with me and do what I want and overrun all those petty naysayers who don't want to do what I do. I'll get my way with less trouble, and maybe we'll deliver better results for my generation than we've been having till now. If you're over 70, so I know what that means. Uh, it means. You know, the truncheon, it means war, it means oppression. Um, and, and if you're in your 50s, you say, well, my parents told me what it means. But, you know, the, main, the memories are getting fading. But I think it's also true, if you're of a certain age, you remember that the democratic system not only prevailed in the greatest conflict in world history, but then set up a stable peace, a generous peace in which former enemies became friends and delivered the fastest rate of increase in um, standard of living for ordinary people in the history of the world. It worked. If you remember the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the early 70s, it, you know, democracy proved itself. Um, it wasn't just that everything else was bad, this was affirmatively good. The delivery rate has become less successful, and especially in the 21st century. Uh, and so people who only know that um, are receptive to do messages and whatever else the Russians are bad at, one of the things they're very good at is micro-targeting grievances. There, there's some research the other day that found, that looked at um, people who tweet, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, uh, anti-police, pro-police slogans. And many of the, they, they get into like flame wars on, on Twitter. The person who said it found the most combative of these Black Lives Matter hashtags and Blue Lives were bots and probably Russian bots. And it's, what seems to be happening is that there are people sitting in rows in Petersburg. And, you know, the person at desk number one, his job is to make people who believe in Black Lives Matter hate people who believe in Blue Lives Matter and people who, blue, who believe in Blue. And then at the next desk, because somebody has the opposite job, and we are set, we are vulnerable to this. The Russians didn't create this, but they exploit it. Well, I want to play you a clip um, from President Trump. This is uh, Donald Trump at the Conservative Political Action Conference last February. And I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people. And they are. They are the enemy of the people. The enemy of the people. David, right. from last, uh, Republican Senator Jeff Flake last week said President Trump's description of the U.S. media as enemies of the people is Stalinist. Well, well, that is the phrase that Stalin's prosecutor, uh, Vyshinsky, shouted at people at the Moscow trials of the 1930s before sending them off to death. Um, it's important to decode. When Donald Trump says fake news, he means accurate reporting. Uh, when he says deep state, he means the rule of law. Everything is upside down. The, um, one, and this is one of the things that goes to one of Trump's gifts. Trump has an instinct for the weak, for weak points. There is such a thing as fake news. Fake news is what the Russians created 
to promote the candidacy of Donald Trump. Deliberate in, uh, inventions spread through social media in order to affect behavior. Uh, what Donald Trump then took, that, that, this was a real, this concept when it was introduced was a dangerous concept to Donald Trump because he owes so much to fake news of the literal kind. So as he so often do, does, he took this weapon against him and he shamelessly, without any regard for truth, turned it around and said, when people report accurately on what I do and what I say, that is the fake news. You have a you have a passage that I'm going to actually read from because it really speaks to what you're you're telling us. The thing to fear from the Trump presidency is not the bold overthrow of the Constitution, but the stealthy paralysis of governance, not the defiance of law, but an accumulating subversion of norms, not the deployment of state power to intimidate dissidents, but the incitement of private violence to radicalize supporters. So I'm looking at that phrase again mm -hmm. the other day and I'm reading, OK, paralysis of government underway. Um, uh, private violence, Charlottesville. Um, is this by design? It's by instinct. I, I, Trump is not strategic, but he is brilliantly intuitive. Um, he, he knows, and he also, he follows the course of least resistance. When Donald Trump was first elected, a lot of alarmist people would compare what happened to Germany in the 1930s. And I thought, I, I kept, when I started this, I was trying to explain to them, this is wrong. I mean, uh, that is, you don't take the most extreme case of democratic breakdown in the entire history of the world with the most horrible consequences after and say, right, it's going to be like that. That's the outlier. There are a lot, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of stops on the train line of bad before you get to Hitler station. Donald Trump, it's not a sudden seizure. It's not a heart attack. It's gum disease. You can die from gum disease, but you don't die run right away. Your body just corrodes and it begins to emit toxins and the toxins get into the bloodstream and those toxins eventually affect the heart and, and you can die. Uh, but you also have time. You also have time. One of the problems that also goes along with this view that, oh my gosh, there's going to be some sudden crisis is it invites everyone to say, I'll be a hero later. When the crisis comes, count, and a lot of the Republicans in the Senate think this, look, if Donald Trump tries to arrest anybody, I'll be there to stop it. But it's not, that's not what we need you to act against. We need you a long time before then. When the, thing, when the rot, we need you to work on those gums and to, and to notice <laughs> that, that things are just festering. Don't wait for the dramatic hour to be a hero. If it actually ever does come to that, it'll be too late. President Trump supporters and some others would say, we don't like what he's doing, but the economy is booming. ISIS has basically been defeated. Uh, Neil Gorsuch is in the Supreme Court. Uh, fewer people than ever are trying to cross into the United States from Mexico. Yeah. What's not to like? The economy is strengthening. And those who think that Donald Trump is going to go away all by himself need to keep this in mind. As the economy strengthens, I hypothesize one of the stories of 2018 is that Donald Trump, Trump's poll numbers are at last going to go, begin to go up. He will be stronger in 2018 than he has been in 2017. And if the Republicans take losses in the mid-year elections or the midterm elections in 2018, for the Republican Party and for conservatives, Donald Trump will then be maybe the only game in town. They will be more loyal to him. As the Republican Party weakens within America, Donald Trump gets stronger within the Republican Party. David Frum, you make us think. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Frum, senior editor of The Atlantic magazine, author of the new book, Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic. He joined me in Toronto. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. This is The Current.